So this is a 13 foot tall basement wall. And I want to talk about the bracing of the corners. Uh, the corners have to be braced with a corner post. Typically it's a two by six, but because this corner is so tall and it's a big 10 inch wide wall, we decided to use two by eights for the corner post instead. Just a little stronger. When you're bracing the outside corner, you have to stop it from doing three things. Tipping back in either direction, twisting, and bowing. The premise behind this is you stand up your corner brace, and then you put horizontal two by fours that are get overlapped with a splice board. These horizontal two by fours stop the corner post from twisting, from bowing, and from tilting back. They also protect the corner poly panel that's going to have all the pressure against it. When the concrete has to turn the corner, coming this way, it's going to push really hard against this corner. And this flat 2x4 stops that from bowing and bending. And if you want, if you can, throw one just the angle two by four, put a hell of it down. Which is actually the first two by four you put in the corner really post. Trucks. And you stand your corner post up. You attach the angle two by four, and you adjust it plumb. Then you come along and you slide these horizontals behind it and put it in place. So the horizontal two by fours. Whenever you put horizontal two by fours on this corner, you always screw it in the first plastic stud off the corner. Then you go every other stud. Which this one's not done yet, I see. Then in the other two by four, you just flip flop. You still go on the first stud, but you flip flop and zigzag the other, the other stud. Then you put your lap boards on. The lap boards should be like 16 inches long or longer and you got to get two screws over here and two screws over here and that stops this corner from pushing out like that and it connects the corner post to this as we see stop it from doing that. The reason these boards are on here with a rope is because this is a contractor that does many jobs and so he just makes these and when he takes them off he throws them over the string over his shoulder and he can carry a whole bunch of them around to every corner. Okay, this is a short corner, what I call a short corner. It's not very long and it's really tall. So when you're bracing a real short wall that's real tall, this angle brace can kind of get at a too steep of an angle where it doesn't provide enough strength for that corner tipping back. So this corner is not braced up yet, but what they're going to do to add strength to this corner is when they put their horizontals in that butt up and tie into the corner like I showed you earlier. They also want to screw a 2x4 to the back side, stick it in the corner, and then screw to this wall. So that corner is tied to this wall, pulling on it. So as I'm walking around inspecting a project before the pour, I always inspect the corners. And typically with uh, do-it-yourselfers or first-timers, it's very easy for them to do everything on the corner bracing. It just gets forgot about or they move on, they're anxious to put up wall. But this one here I inspected, uh, there's no lap boards. That's the board that goes across here that ties the corner into the lap boards. Uh, if I didn't inspect it, and they didn't realize it, they would pour. This corner post could twist or bolt. So anybody that's doing the form system, you gotta do take every step. Just like any forming system, you gotta put all the cross ties in across. If you forget one, you can have problems. This is a window opening in a basement. And this is a typical window opening in the basement, how you want to brace it. You gotta have horizontal two by fours going across, stop from bulging in. What they need to put on here yet is a vertical to hold up the header. Okay, the easiest method now is you'll probably put two by fours on each side, going to the top, coming down, and sitting on top of the two by four going across here. 
see the most important thing in these bucks is we leave the bottom wide open. That way we can make sure it's filled with concrete. So when we pour concrete, we'll pour along, and it might get this high, which it starts bubbling out. Let it bubble out so it fills half of the buck, jump to the other side, fill up so high, let it bubble out, and then move on. When you come around to the next lift, if you're pouring concrete right, it'll probably be stiff enough that it'll hold and it won't bubble out. If it's too wet and it doesn't want to bubble, then you can just drop the board across the top here, pour across the whole thing, and screw it down and stop it from bubbling out. Here's a typical uh, basement walkout door sitting on top of a frost hole that's bare concrete and they attached two 2x4s. Two they tap on one 2x4 to the frost hole and they added another 2x4 to the face of that. That's what the whole forms are sitting on. So they're pouring an 8-inch concrete wall on top of a bare concrete wall. So that's one method doing it. Foam forms are not that heavy, so that's why you do it. Uh, they did a good job here of bracing, they're bracing the sides from coming in, and more importantly, they're bracing the top from saving up. And then your angle board to stop it from tilting. Beautiful job. Lumber here, not treated lumber, because the white lumber is protected with tar paper on top. And on the sides, there's a plastic cutoff that goes in here, that holds the power handle, protects the lumber from the concrete. You'll need four to make it. Okay, uh, people ask how do you make a splice cut on the job site? You have to cut a poly panel in half, you have to put this groove in on the side. That's where the plastic teeth stick. So how you set your table saw for making that groove, it's good to have a little cheap plastic table saw set through a poly panel that have a good edge on top and use it for a guide. And then you just slide the fence over to match the width. You're setting your guide using a poly panel. Set it a little lower. There. Now typically, you want to use two saw blades to give you the proper width cut. Two of the thinnest saw blades you can find gives you the proper width. One saw blade may be a little bit too tight for you, depending on your teeth. This groove is actually 3 sixteenths of an inch wide. Now this here is a custom made saw. What it does is it grooves the poly panel and it sands the edge off to provide a nice custom uh, edge or factory edge. This little edge sanded off is for the thickness of the plastic that sits up against it. So all this is, is the saw that I made the, using a cordless Makita saw. I just got myself a custom shaft made. Cost seventy five dollars. I added two little saw blades to that shaft, a little sanding disc with a nut, and that's on a rubber, a big rubber uh, hole. The spindle sander. Then I made a nice little channel to slide in across. Little little saws like this for the professional guy that does it over and over again. That really saves a lot of time. This is one form, this is a professional bracing set for ICFs. And what it is, just aluminum channel. You screw it right to the plastic studs in the form system. And then it's got a lock plank and a kicker bracket. And this kicker bracket you can adjust to move the wall in and out. Now this one here, these happen to be 12 foot 2 on the inside and 13 foot overall tall walls. And this bracing system is 12 foot tall. So this is more of a commercial setup. You can put up these walls just with using lumber uh, and making your own basin if you can't find a place to rent these or borrow them or whatever. So I'll show you the lumber 
racing system that you can build on your own next time. Professional system, next best thing is to get a bunch of these turnbuckles. They're cheap, they're 16 bucks a piece. Try to get some high outlet. You can attach them to 2x4s. So we're standing between two big doors on the inside of a building. And one of the unique things that we can do with TF that no other ICF can do, or any other fan system really, is form up the wall one-sided. Now you can add these polystyrene panels in, so just by sliding these open and sliding them in. And the top one you slide from the top, but you can fill this in later. You also notice that you can stack our studs the same as poly panels. They don't have to be continuous. You can put pieces on top of pieces to make wall. So I want to point out the rebar, how it's tied, and the rebar chairs. The rebar chairs, or the divots that the rebar sits in, on top of these studs, they don't have to sit into every one of them. They just, the horizontals just have to sit in one every so often, kind of hold it in place. Because the zip ties will hold it in place. Like you see here, this rebar is not even sitting in that chair. It's no big deal. Because it's sitting in the chair back here, and it's sitting in the chair back here. So they don't all have to be perfect, you don't have to sit there. The vertical rebar always is tied to the horizontal rebar. Here we got a T intersection. And basically I want uh, the camera guy to zero in and close up on what a T intersection looks like and how it's made. Basically, you know, I there's a groove cut in the face of these panels on this wall. And this stud is stuck into that groove. You can see it here. And then it's screwed with plastic studs on the opposing wall. So typically, this T intersection get built first ahead of time, stood up, and then you build off from the T intersection each way. Here's another T intersection, just like we were talking about earlier. And you can get a better view of how these plastic studs are stuck into the foam, a groove in the foam. And then they're screwed to the plastic studs on the opposing wall. The back side of the tuner section is a custom cut poly panel that is the same width as the concrete wall coming off this, this way. So that panel changes depending on what size wall you got coming this way. So these panels, you just run them on a table saw and you cut a groove in the face to stick this plastic stud in. Now, to find where that groove goes on the face of this panel, it's simple. It's exactly the same as the side of a panel groove. Meaning, if you were to put this panel up there, it's in the exact same spot. So if you have your table saw all set up for making this groove, you just run the face of that poly panel through that top. This is where a TF form system meets an aluminum formed retaining wall right at the corner. And so there's a lot of pressure on this T intersection because there's another wall going that way. So there's going to be a lot of pushback this way. So you can see how we brace back the T with some horizontal 2 by 4s and then kick it back to the bank. It gives perspective on how tall it is. Yeah. So we're back at the corner and we finished putting all the attachment 2x4s on that were left off from before. And this corner is a real short corner and it turns the other way. So we just provided some additional kickers back to the bank just for extra strength. So the contractor, homer, homeowner doing this offer cut all these rebar to wet stick into the top of the concrete wall after we're done pouring. And they stick into the concrete two feet in and two feet out. And that's to tie the two walls together. So now this is a shut off or shut end of a wall. This happens to be at the end of a stairwell in the basement. And what they're doing here is called what we call hog stroffing. So we've got a plastic shut off that holds the poly panel in place. Then you just slap up a board and you run the 2x4s past and turn a 2x4 down on edge. Now just, just this alone provides a lot of strength. 
this extra kickers provides maximum strength.